sure that this microphone is uh, working because the last time we didn't get any of our recording <clears throat> and I want to make sure that we are okay and we don't have any issues with recording. Uh, we want to give it a minute here and let TikTok uh, uh, get logged in here. We want our TikTok audience to be um, watching us as well and we definitely this is a midday bible study so i like to uh you know give everybody a chance that are on our platforms that pay any attention to us uh a chance to be able to join us so uh just give us a moment here we're going to let TikTok uh get in because last time facebook uh believe it or not we actually had more TikTok viewers watching us than Facebook ever has watched. So I have to spend a little bit more time entertaining my TikTok audience, Facebook, because you guys don't understand that I need you to like the video. Now, listen, I'm not asking you guys for any offering. I'm not asking you for any tithe. Every preacher scam in America finds a way to ask you for some kind of a seed offering and they wrap it up with the word of the most high. I don't do that. I'm never going to do that. I'm never going to be that type of a preacher that I'm prostituting the most high's word so I can get a check. I'll never make that a way of living. I'll never receive an offering that I inducted or introduced or made or offered or made somebody feel like they obligated that they have to give. I think that that is the number one mistake of the churches today is because it's now become more of a financial industry uh, where you're looking at at first, it was about bring me the ties for the storehouse. And over the years, as we look at this time, as it goes on, the storehouse became my house. And, and now you've got preachers and apostles and super bishops and doctor bishops and archbishops and everybody's got to wear a bishop hat. And then when we get to service, it's awful funny how when we have a gathering of a revival or a bunch of churches get together of some sort, it's awful funny how that plate is passed more than one time. I've been in church my entire life. I've been involved with revivals. I've been involved with conferences. I've been involved with it, and I know how it goes. It'll always start off with your general offering that everybody will give, and then when the preacher gets up so that everybody makes sure that the preacher's paid well, they'll take up usually one to two additional offerings, speaker offerings, building fund offerings, this, that, this, that, this, that. And then when we look at the church as a whole, what is it really doing to give back to the community? When I say give back to the community, <clears throat> we, I'm not talking about you having a few community walks and knocking on some doors and <clears throat> passing out some tracks. Um, you know, the standard <clears throat> 
pray for the hood, the standard, give out a few Christmas baskets. Where are the churches when their people are in need? And when I'm talking about need, I'm talking about financial need, spiritual need, uh, emotional need. The church is supposed to be, according to what the New Testament taught, it's supposed to be the backbone <clears throat> of this thing called the Christianity walk. And the reason that I have a problem with Christianity is because we make excuses for the things that we want to do in Christianity. And we dress it all up and make it sound like it is the most high. Which brings me to my subject at hand today, which I want to deal with, which is the subject of divorce and all of the falsified, scamified teaching that surrounds divorce. Now, let me explain this to you. I believe it's an issue because it's the same teaching that is taught just about it. Every church, anywhere you go, but yet the churches have the highest rates of divorce. It doesn't it doesn't matter that you're teaching this. Obviously, there's got to be some churches are continually having divorce rates going up, up, and up. <clears throat> we all serve in this Jesus. Everybody in here, Holy Ghost field. We all fire baptized. Well, the rates of divorce and separation are constantly growing, yet the teaching that they're giving concerning marriage is completely wrong, which is why we have so many high rates in divorce. Let me explain this to you. The Bible teaches us in the very beginning, <clears throat> we're not going to even get to the New Testament. I don't even want to hear the New Testament theology concerning marriage and divorce. I've heard it my entire life. I know it like the back of my hand. And what I did not do as a true leader and minister in my past was I never took the time to really study out the Old Testament. So when we get to the New Testament, I've been surrounded by churches my entire life where the most important, the basis of their messages were all surrounding what Paul said, what Peter said what this Jesus said, completely forgetting everything that the Most High Yah wrote before any of these other books came about. The Most High wrote things that he said will uh, that should never change. He wrote things that he said is, this is a commandment. He wrote things that he said, this is my will. And we somehow get into this New Testament, the New Testament scam is what I like to call it, because who called it the New Testament? Who? First of all, the Old Testament was not even referred to as the Old Testament. It was referred to as the law or the Torah, the, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And then it became the Tanakh which was the all of what you have in the Old Testament, including what they took out. So there's a whole lot more information that is in that book. But somehow most of the churches skate past all of that. And we're somehow in the book of Acts. We're, to, we're saying we can live however we want, but we can repent and say, I'm sorry. But the scam is the fact that you're not truly sorry because you're still doing the same things. See, repentance is not, I'm sorry, and then, oh, I, I slipped again. I'm sorry, and then, no, uh, ooh, I made a, I made a boo-boo, I'm sorry. No, repentance is, I am saying to the most I look, I made a mistake, I see my mistake, and I'm going to do everything in my power to not make that mistake again. Come hell, high water, I'm going to stay as clear away from that as possible, such as when I had to put down the alcohol, y'all. 
It was not about how I felt or how I wanted to party. It was about what was the most high trying to pull out of me. He used me in so many young men's lives that I got to see come out of addiction because of the things I was able to uh, to to give to them and, and enrich them. Because AA is not ministry. I didn't have to stop alcohol with no type of AA. I stopped when I was ready to stop. And so somebody has to be the person that says, no, you don't need to take your stupid AA step. You don't need no stupid medication stray jacket. You don't, I used to tell those men in there, don't you even refer to yourself as an alcoholic when I teach you, because if you do, then I don't have any desire to come in here and spend my time trying to enrich you. I'm not here to preach to you. I'm not here to dog you. I'm not here to judge you. What I'm here to do is to build you back up. And the only way I can do so is by telling you my true story. And my true story was when I was ready to stop drinking, I just stopped. You understand me? I stopped. The Most High does not put some kind of vex on you when it comes to things that are destroying your life. He will allow things to happen for you to get your attention. And it's up to you if you're going to pay attention to it. You understand? So we've got to take a look at these things a little bit more different. So divorce that they taught us in the church. Let's get back to the beginning. In the beginning, the Most High said that a uh, man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So let me start right there. All of this stuff where we don't understand that the husband and the wife become one, that doesn't mean anybody else comes in between that husband and wife, period. Now, listen, I am not telling you I'm Steve Harvey and I've got it all together and my marriage is okay, perfect all the time and none of that. But I will tell you, I've been married 20 years and I've learned some things along the way. It didn't just happen overnight, but there's some things that I had to physically change about myself or I would have been divorced years ago, years ago. You understand me? Years ago. So what I'm trying to say to you is when you understand that when I marry a woman, she and I become one. That means you have to separate everybody else in the midst of that one because, and that includes children. See, if you allow your children to interfere in your marriage, your union with your spouse, you are making a bad mistake because your children are going to one day spread their wings and live their lives. And when they do, your union won't be. It'll be destroyed. It won't even be anything if it makes it that far, not to mention the emotional breakdown that you will receive and experience throughout those years until the children leave the house. This is why you see marriages divorced as soon as the kids leave the house. That's what you see a lot of times happen. Kids leave the house, now the marriage just finally reveals itself and the two people cannot exist together. And that is where the enemy came in and we like to say what he, he, he still kills and destroys. That's what he did, he came in there and he used your children, or he used your mommy, or he used your brothers and sisters, or he used your job, or whatever he used, he used something and put it in front of your union. And it created a wedge between you and your spouse. So the first thing is we've got to take a look at what he meant by when he said they shall become one. That settles it. That's from the beginning. Now, we get into church and all the way into the New Testament, somehow they have taught you to never to divorce. I don't care what happens. They pull up Jesus's scripture. 
They pull up all of these scriptures to support their claim that you are just supposed to stay with your spouse no matter what. And this is where the false teaching comes. This allowed the churches to somehow excuse adultery. And this is why adultery is so much excused in the church because they have allowed it to creep in to the point where now you've got marriages, but yet they're cheating on each other. They're cheating through Facebook. They're cheating through social media. They're cheating through email. They're cheating at work or they're physically hitting the mumble rumble. And the reality of it is the false teaching of the church, they have taught somehow you are supposed to still take that and accept that. And this is why a lot of the women in the churches have accepted their pastor, preacher, musician, husband, cheating on them over and over and over again because it's some false prophet somewhere whispering in their ears saying you got to stick it out. Now, let me explain to you. We just covered yesterday where Proverbs tells us that he that finds a wife finds a good thing. So we understand that the husband, the man picks his wife. But this is where the Most High gets involved. When you stand before the preacher, the judge, the whoever, and you take those vows, I don't care who performs the ceremony, the Most High becomes a witness between you and your spouse. So what then happens is, you might have forgot those vows you stood there and said in front of all your ugly ass family and friends. He or she, you or he or she might have forgot those vows, but the Most High did not. So it's very important that you understand the symbolicness, even though we know that the wedding ceremony is a scam, wearing even a marriage wedding ring is a scam. It's all Catholicism, but we still got to see the symbolicness of what the marriage ceremony represents. The father is taking the bride and he's giving the bride to the husband, saying that my protection, my lead, my cover is now being transferred from me to you. And now I expect and she should expect the same thing that she got from me from this husband. So that is the father giving this bride away. But before any of all of that happens, there's a witness who we can't see that is in that is in the spiritual realm who is hearing every word that you are saying. And we know that the scripture says don't make any vows you can't keep. That includes your marriage vows. He don't want you making fake promises and then lying. We tell him about living right. This is what the Bible teaches. So the false teaching that you are just supposed to stay through that is false. And here's why it's false, because there is a book that they took out of the Bible that clearly states there is a... Uh, exception, so to speak, when it comes to divorce. And the reality of it is adultery is the ultimate betrayal because you're not only betraying your spouse, but you're also betraying the most high. And the person that you are involved with is putting curses that he or she don't even know on their family because they're interfering with that covenant and that vow. So we've got to understand this. Now, if so happened, your spouse decided to step out on you, you have the right to forgive that spouse. That's your choice. You have the right to say, you know what? I forgive you. But 
True forgiveness has to come when you can say, I will not bring it up anymore. I can't bring it up anymore. I don't resent you for it. And I forgive you. And then when you reconsummate that marriage to the most high, that settles it. So you don't get to go back later and say, oh, you did it to me, so now I'm going to do it to you. Which is, again, what goes on in the churches. It goes on constantly. And it's not talked about because the preachers are doing a lot of it. It's not discussed that the preacher is messing with the, the sister, sister Jenkins and messing with or brother Jenkins in these day and age. And it's hushed. It's not discussed. It's like what they did with Reverend James Cleveland. People are going to be mad at me for this, but I really don't give a damn because it's the facts. The man was molesting children for years and y'all want to turn around and give this man the title of the king of gospel? Are you kidding me? He passes away and his son sues his estate for infecting him with HIV and they settle. And you want to then tell me that James Cleveland is so great because he came up with these words in this music arrangement. I don't care what he came up with. If you're going to throw out Michael Jackson and you're going to throw out all these other people, don't you sit up and make excuses for your favorite Christian artists. Don't make excuses for that. That's the reality of it. I, Dr. Tony Evans, again, I don't never listen to him, so I don't really know or care too much about his teaching. I think I have turned on one message before and I was not moved. I was not amused. So, again, I don't care what anybody's thoughts are. This is where we're on the street talk TV, which means we talk about our opinions. And you can share your opinion, and I'm not going to be offended. But this is my opinion. Dr. Tony Evans, it's a bullshit scam to get up here and stand in front of all these people and say you are sitting down for old sin. Don't that can 1,000% contradict the entire Christianity message that says I'm putting off the old man and putting on the new? If it's old sin, it doesn't matter. The real question is, if, why didn't you sit down then? Don't tell me now you're going to sit down for something back then. That doesn't even make a hill of bean sense, because if that's the case, every single preacher, church member, or any church anywhere needs to be sitting their asses down right now for everything that they did that was old. If we're going to take off the old and put on the new, then don't give me that. That's horse wash. I'm not expecting you to disclose your sin. We all sin. I'm not telling you this is my business. I'm not the judge. Who am I? I'm not supposed to sit here. What you do? I'm not that guy. But what I can tell you is you didn't have to use that excuse of why you're sitting down. That's the scam. That's the part that I can't receive. That's the part that makes me lose all respect for this man. Even if he had any of my respect, I've lost it because you can't sit here like a like I'm a two year old and explain to me how this makes any sense. And the church folks ate this stuff up without any questions. Nobody said, oh, wait a minute, this man is playing us all like a fool. Every church in America, at least all the black churches that I know of, they all teach put off the old man and put on the new. So that means the poor preacher from the preacher to the pulpit to the door, everybody in here got some old sin. So if that's the case, there shouldn't be nobody functioning on Sunday. Sir, the scam, it doesn't make sense. Now, I'm not going to get down the rabbit holes that all these YouTubers are doing, trying to make up stuff and make up lies and, and tear down a man about some sin that has not come out with no evidence. I'm just not going to do that. I learned my lesson with Bishop T.D. Jakes. It was 1,000 percent wrong for Larry Reed to put that garbage out there to the public like that without no evidence or receipts and destroy that man's physical image forever. And he still ain't produced the receipts that he told the public. I don't ever want to be that YouTube guy. I'm not here to gossip, but facts are facts. The reality of it is it's a scam to tell me that you're sitting down today for old sin. That don't work, buddy. Now, you could have said 
I committed some recent sin and ain't your business. I would have received that more. I would have respected that. I did something I shouldn't have done. <laughs> but to say old sin, man, brother, stop it. That's why I've lost so much respect for the churches today, because all it's about is a show, a fashion show, and how much money we're going to collect. Nobody's looking at the practical facts of situations, just like when Bishop T.D. Jakes was in this news to come out and say, I ain't done none of it. You're a damn scamming lie. Why? Because there's evidence of you at least being at this man's party. It's evidence of it out there. So the reality is you might not have done this part or that part or that part, but to come out here and blatantly say, I ain't done none of it, it makes you a liar. It makes you a scam, a false, what the Bible calls a false prophet. Because the reality of it is, how can you get up there and literally say, I did none of it. No. Now, if you were not at the parties, there wouldn't be any speculation because you're Bishop T.D. Jakes. You shouldn't be hanging out with Diddy. This guy and you are complete opposite. What could be possibly going on at this man's party that you would want to even be involved in? You should have thought about your professional image more than anything. So once again, I don't care how much you love these preachers. The facts are the facts and the scripture is the scripture. So now let me get to the scripture that I want to talk about today. First of all, we're going to deal with Malachi chapter number two, because I just broke down to you the importance of the covenant that you make when you stand before the Most High and you take vows to be with your spouse. Now, at least listen to somebody that has made it 20 years. Don't go listen to somebody that's been divorced four or five times. They couldn't tell me a hill of beans. Me and my wife have been to hell, back, hell, back some more, going through hell now and going through it some more and going back up, down, and around again. And every time we looked to assistance from anybody, all they did was made our situation worse. And that's what I've learned over the 20 years of being married to my wife. You keep people out of your business. That includes children, mother, father. Your pastor don't need to know certain things. Your pastor, he ain't pastor in that home. Your husband is supposed to be the pastor at home. Now, your pastor pastors the church. He can give you spiritual guidance, but he ain't supposed to be leading your home. That's completely out of scripture itself because he, the man, is the leader of that home. That's established back in the Tanakh. So now they always like to go to Malachi chapter two when it comes time to talking about tithes and offering. This is what I've seen in church my entire life. I've been in Kojic. I've been in Pentecostal. I've been in Apostolic. I've been in Baptist. I've been in non-denominational. I've been in all of all. I've been in all. I've played instruments. I've sang. I've led praise and worship. I've been involved in the scam. And just about my entire life of church, every time you hear Malachi chapter number two at anybody's church, it's usually they're getting ready to start talking about money. But what's peculiar about this is the fact that there's a lot more important information in this same chapter that we somehow don't even acknowledge. Every one of these churches that I have been involved in, I've seen them go to this chapter, but they specifically go here for robbing and tithes and offering. Well, I've got to beg the differ for you all because let's take a look here. Verse 13, chapter two says, and this have you done again, covering the altar of Yahuwah with tears, with weeping and with crying out so much so that he regards not the offering anymore. So he don't even want your money. So these churches teaching you, oh, don't matter where it come from, put it in the basket. Well, that ain't what the scripture says. That's what the, 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 the most high doesn't even want the offering. If he doesn't accept the offering, then how in the world is the church accepting it? You got to ask yourself that. 
I ain't even went nowhere further on this scripture besides verse 13 that says, and this have you done again, covering the altar of Yahuwah with tears. What are you doing? You're crying at the altar. Lord, we be okay. Just help me, bless me. Oh, save me, Lord. I won't do it again. With crying out so much so that he regards not the offering anymore. So that debunks anybody telling you it don't matter where it come from. Just give. No, 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 no. Some of your givings are cursed because if he don't regard it or respect it or honor it or even recognize it, what makes you think you're going to be blessed because you put something in a basket, but you're living like the devil all week disregarding every one of the things he wrote? It don't, it don't wash. It don't make no sense. He says, or receives it with goodwill at your hand. So he don't even receive your money at goodwill. So stop it. I don't care how much money you're giving to the church. I don't care if you write the church $100,000 right now, Tyler Perry, million dollars. I could care less. The Most High said he don't even regard the offering. Then verse 14 says, yet you say wherefore? Question mark. Because, pay attention, this is confirming exactly what I just told you. Because Yahuwah has been witness between you and the woman of your youth. Who is the woman of your youth? You, you can't have five of them. You can't have 12 of them. I don't care what these scams today that are trying to cover up their sexual addiction and, and use multiple wives as, as something as the most high's way of living. No. That's that's a crock of garbage too. My, I don't even this garbage. You can't give me that because he's talking about a woman. He didn't say women. He said woman. So that means there's one woman of your youth. Every man has one. If you done bounced around and had fifteen of them, you gotta ask yourself: Are you in the will of the Most High? Are you? Don't give me the New Testament. When we know that it wasn't even the Most High that authorized the change of the name. I don't even know where the New Testament came from. Because he said he changes not in the same book that we're in right now. He says, I change not. So when did he come and say, now I need somebody to save you? No, he's your savior. You know why? Because he's the one that breathes life into your body. He's the one that's going to turn the lights off when it's time to go. You know, when my grandmother was passing, I was praying and calling on Jesus like you wouldn't believe, screaming and crying and hoping. And grandma was screaming and crying. And you know what? She still had to pass. She still had to pass. And there was Jesus didn't come in the room and sit on the bed and stop the cancer. Ain't that what the New Testament teaches? He just touched folks and they just got healed. Well, where is that healing today if that is so accurate? Where is it? Somebody, don't you tell me the scam of speak it into existence, because if that's the case, I should be able to speak into existence a million dollars right now, and it boom, it pops in my hand. That's what makes that statement a scam. So don't give me that crap. The scripture says he, because he was a witness, he, first of all, yet you say wherefore, because Yahuwah has been a witness between you and the woman of your youth, that's one, guys, fellas, that's only one. I don't give a damn what they want to dress up to make look good to you. The scripture says woman. We ain't even in the New Testament yet. He says, against whom you have dealt treacherously. That's what the Sephir says. New King James says, you have put away. You look up the definition of put away. In today's terms, it is divorce. So let's read that again in the terms of what today is. Yet you say, wherefore, because Yahuwah has been a witness between you and the woman of your youth against whom you have divorced. Yet, colon, yet is she your companion, comma, and the woman of your covenant? So again, we're talking about marriage here. This is in the book of Malachi. I ain't even went to none of the books they took out yet. Verse 15 says, and did not he make one 
Didn't I just tell you in the beginning, he said that the husband, the man leaves the father, the father and the mother and joins to the woman and they become one? Well, he comes back and confirms that for you right here in Malachi. Yet had he the remnant of the spirit and wherefore one that he might seek a seed of Yahuwah. What is he talking about? He wants to see your children produce his ways, come up in his ways, knowing the will, knowing the way, knowing his commandments, knowing his statutes, knowing what it is to live the way he wants you to live. That's why he wants you and your, 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 your spouse to be one, because he's expecting you to be one, because how can you make a seed of him if you and her or him are not one? Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none divorce against the woman of his youth. That's pretty clear to me. It's pretty clear to me, but there is an exception. For Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel, says that he hates putting away. See, they go to that and they'll take that out and say, oh, he hates divorce because Jesus supposedly said it. No, the Most High said it. He hates putting away. For one covers violence with his garment, says Yahuwah. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not divorce. That is the scripture in Malachi. Now, in the book of Siraj, which is one of the books that is in the Apocrypha that they took out. Because I don't want you to think that if your wife decided to cheat on you or your husband decided to cheat on you, I'm gonna sit here as these false scamified prophets are and tell you to pray it out, stick it out, and just and let, 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 let God be God. Let, 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 let the most high be the most high. I'm not gonna do that. I'm never going to do that. I'm going to tell you all what the scripture says. And the truth of the matter is adultery is one of the absolute worst things you can do because you got to remember you are not just affecting or offending your spouse, but you're also offending the most high. And see, that's the part that we always seem to forget. We forget the part that we are offending him because not only are we breaking the, the command that he told us in the Tanakh not to make a, 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 a vow that we don't keep, which means don't make false fake promises that we don't keep. So you standing up there in front of all your ugly ass relatives and friends making this false pro promise to everybody as witnesses that you're going to stay with this woman or husband for the rest of your life till you die and all of that. And you stand there in front of the most high and say that, and then don't keep your word. Do you really think that the most high is going to be happy with your decision the next time you didn't keep your word and don't let it be multiple times. I mean, are you kidding me? Do you think there's going to be some repercussions that are going to show up in your life, your children's lives, all because you did not keep your word? So I'm going to read to you one in the book of Ecclesiasticus, which you guys have Ecclesiastes, but you don't have Ecclesiasticus, which is also pronounced or uh, pronounced Sirach. Now, there's speculation, according to I've read this book inside and out. I've read all these books. Oh, my goodness. I read them all. OK. Um, but when you start studying out these books, it's almost like the most high begins to reveal to you through the scripture. This is what makes the Bible true because he says to study, to show yourself approved. Well, this is the truth of it because as you begin to study and take it in, and I tell y'all, I spent three whole entire years studying it out. I turned the preachers off. I stopped going to church I picked up the Bible. I started from Genesis. I read all the way through the Revelation. I read it backwards. I went back through it again. And I noticed the more I read it, I started real, it started being revealed to me. Wait a minute, there's some holes here. There's some gaps here that need to be explained that no nobody wanna talk about. 
So we're just going to skip right from Adam and Eve straight to Noah with nothing in between besides Seth. And that's all we talk about. No, there's got to be more to the story. And I went the extra mile and I realized that there is more to the story. They left the evidence in the book. Go to Joshua 10, 10 verse 10, uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 13. And you'll see that they clearly state that there was a book by the name of Jasher that once existed in your Bible. And they were too ridiculously ignorant to remove the evidence because they left that there twice. In the book of Joshua, it says, is not this written in the book of Jasher? In the book of 2 Samuel, it says, this is written in the book of Jasher. And nobody stopped and said, where in the hell is the book of Jasher? And you think you have it all, preacher? I don't care what your degree says. I don't care what your theology says. I don't care what your school says. If you just study out the book that you, this here book that we carry, everybody want to talk from, you will see that there's gaps in there that you can't just give me, oh, we're going to know when we meet him. No, 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 no. Study to show yourself approved. The Most High will begin to reveal to you. And as I began to study this particular book out, Ecclesiastic Cuss, I'm in, in, I'm in even the wrong book. Yeah, Sirach, Ecclesiastic Cuss. It began to come through my spirit that this person that's writing is very familiar and it also resembles every other book that this same person wrote. And so it's my speculation, it's not been confirmed yet, but it's my speculation that this book is written by King Solomon. Now you're gonna have to read it for yourself and see if, if, if you could agree with me on that. But I'm going to tell you right now that this book, it is a complete, the way it's written, the way it's uh, addressed, how he addresses things. I highly 1000% believe that it is um, King Solomon's writing. So there's, there's more writing that King Solomon wrote about. Now. Let's talk about the woman, since this is where I want to give you the other piece that they don't teach in the church. So this is not to beat up or attack the woman. I want you to realize that this is specifically still dealing with the term divorce. So I'm going to run through these really quick, but I do have it on the screen for the Facebook audience. And I want you guys to see these scriptures that they took out. And then I want you to look at today and the customs of today and see what is different and why this was removed. Sirach 719 says, for gold, not a wise and good woman, for her grace is above gold. So fellas, don't be looking just for a good woman. She got to be wise too. Good means she can cook. Good means she can clean. Good means she can she, she she she's dependable. She and good means she got good sex. That's what good means. But wise, he says, for go not a wise and good woman, sir. Have you a woman after your mind? Forsake her not, but give not yourself over to a like woman. That does not mean complexion. If you get into this book, it will show you and reveal to you what he means there. I know what he means. But we're not going to stop there because we'll be there for a while. Be not jealous over the woman of your bosom. So I ain't supposed to be jealous over my wife. At one point in my life, I used to dress like you wouldn't believe everywhere I went. I had to have, if I dressed up, I had to have the matching dress shoes to match the bow tie, to match the hat. To, I had to, you know, and then don't let me and my wife go out together. Oh, my goodness. It was almost like I was competing with her. Let me go and try to do this. Or why don't you match me? And, you know, and it's all vanity. That don't matter because guess what? As you get older, that beauty is going to fade. So, brother, you should never be jealous over your woman. You, I, I had to get that in my mind. Let her shine. Boy, you can show up in some flip flops. Why? Because you're a granddad now, and granddaddies get to wear whatever the hell they want. That's what I've known my whole entire life. All my granddaddies did. That, them, I don't remember them cats was wearing flannels tucked in slacks, flannel. Uh, and granddaddies get to wear whatever. And I have made it to the life where I have a beautiful set of grandbabies. 
And so if I choose to wear Mitch Match socks today and a flip flop because my feet hurt because I'm getting older, then that's just what it needs to be. But my wife is the one that needs to be shining. So if I go out, I'm okay with her looking great. And they look at me like, that is what we need to be understanding. You brothers today all on Facebook and, oh, my goodness, stop it. Where's the masculinity? Did you know that he don't he frowns upon emasculate, emasculate, effeminate men? He doesn't, the most I don't like that. Look that up in the scripture. No, he don't like you laying with a man as you do with a woman, but he also don't like you being effeminate or acting in an effeminate way. That's in the scripture too. Study it out. It's in the old testament. I'm not gonna stop there. I'm just giving y'all some nuggets along the way that you can study out for yourself. Teach her not an evil lesson against yourself. Give not your soul unto a woman to set her foot upon your substance. So that means wise brothers don't just get with a woman and start buying. Y'all here paying for sex and paying for this and paying for attention. Are you kidding me? He says, give not your soul unto a woman to set her foot upon your substance. Use not much the company of a woman that is a singer, lest you be taken with her attempts. That is more talking about the, 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 attempt, the, the uh, term of seduction. When you read this book, you'll see. Turn away your eye from a beautiful woman, brothers. So you shouldn't be out here looking at every woman. I'm glad I don't do that. I'm glad I don't have that problem. I don't have that problem at all. Do you understand me? When I go to a gas station, a grocery store, I don't care if a woman bats her eyes at me. I don't even look her in her eyes. Why? Because I don't even want you to even think for any shape, form, or fashion that I have any interest of uh, risking it all and stepping out on my wife with you. I've been with this woman for 20 years and we have been through it all. Do you think I want to forsake all of that because of your temporary beauty that is going to eventually fade? Is something wrong when a woman gets to 35, 40, 45 years old and, and, and still has not been asked to be married? It's not the man all the time. Y'all got to stop this stuff with it always is the man. Bull, you have some ways and things that maybe need to change about you so that a man will find you and select you as his wife. Because that's what the Bible says. You ain't supposed to pick the husband. Show me that in scripture. Never once in scripture in the history of the Bible did the woman pick the husband. It just didn't happen. So he says, for her love is kindled as fire. Pride was not made for men, nor furious anger for them that are born of a woman. So get that in your mind. Get that in your mind. But the main scripture, and I believe it's at the end um, of this book somewhere in here. Let me find it. Is where he talks about. Uh, divorce. There's a lot of good information in this book, so I would highly recommend y'all stop believing the scam that the uh, Apocrypha is not scripture um, because it's evidence that they took out scriptures and this is the rest of the book. So you've got to understand that there is more to it, but I got to find that scripture. I ain't going to leave y'all out there like that. Let's see. Um, go, not actually. Okay, let me see. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Let me find it, y'all. Hold on. I ain't no scam, y'all. I ain't going to give you nothing that I can't give y'all. Mm -hmm. It's coming. Okay. Ecclesiasticus 25. And 24, we're going to start there. Of the woman came the beginning of sin, and through her we all die. Give the water no passage, neither a wicked woman liberty to gather abroad. If she go not as you would have her, cut her off from your flesh and give her a sepher of divorce and let her go. So now, once again, this debunks 1,000% the whole message that you're just supposed to take everything, put up with everything. Your wife don't want to submit, follow you on nothing that you do. Well, then guess what? You're not going to hell. 
if you say, you know what, I'm going to write you a separation, oh, Bill, we're done, you're fired, and you have every right to replace that wife, not just because of adultery. This scripture says if she will ha not go the way you will have her to go, which means she decided to go this way and you are going this way, which brings me back to my first point that you were supposed to be one. Listen, please like, share, comment. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I really appreciate those of you that spend the time out with me going through the scriptures. I don't care how long it takes and I never rehearse anything. I get up here freestyle and I open up the scriptures and I just give it to you free, just straight off, straight off the press. I do appreciate those that spend the time with me because again, somebody should want to teach you the way the book has intended you to live and not just their spin and their James Brown scam so that you can dance, eat after church, and go back to living like hell and wonder why your life is based around nothing but curses. Again, please like, share, comment, and don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, be blessed on purpose. Thank you.